I'll provide some context. Right out the gate, I had zero interest in Baldur's Gate 3, with me not being a fan of turn-based combat, nor having a spectacular understanding of the world of Dungeons & Dragons. For me, it appeared that Baldur's Gate 3 was geared towards a hardcore Dungeons & Dragons crowd, one that I was very much familiar with, but with fairly limited first-hand experience, which is a super roundabout way of saying I didn't have any friends to play with. It was actually my partner and also my friend's excitement for the game's release that made me aware of its existence, so I decided to pick it up and give it a go. I started Baldur's Gate 3 with the intention of learning the ropes of a particular character I'd recently created for an upcoming in real life D&D campaign, an Oath of Vengeance paladin called Bringyar. As it turns out, Oath of Vengeance paladin is a super basic pick, but I do not care. He is my son, and I love him. With all this in mind, I finally finished my first playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. After the game being out for nearly half a year and clocking in at 146 hours of playtime, I played Baldur's Gate 3 with a dedication that I had not shown towards a single player RPG since I first played Skyrim when I was 14. In simple terms, Baldur's Gate 3 is something truly special, and I think it will be a very long time before we get another game as technically and narratively impressive as this one is. Also, before we begin my review, there will be some gameplay and plot spoilers going forward, so you have been warned. Let's begin with the story side of things. Act 1 begins. You awake, imprisoned on a nautiloid. A huge, imposing, biologically operated spaceship commanded by mind flayers, who intend to kidnap and infect the populace of Faerun with tadpoles, but would inevitably transform a person into one of them, destined to lose any trace of themselves and join the Mind Flayer hive mind. Side note, the Nautiloid also has doors referred to as sphincters. There was absolutely no way I wasn't going to mention that. As the ship is attacked, you escape your pod, and from the very moment you escape and take control of your character, what happens next is entirely up to you. What I really enjoyed wasn't just the amount of choice Larian Studios gives the player, but how much the choices made matter. Across the 140 plus hours I played, even in the very end of Act 3, I found myself reaping the consequences of decisions I'd made way back in Act 1, which by this point felt like choices I'd made a lifetime ago. Act 1 introduces you to this concept, but ensures that while these are your first choices, they will have overarching consequences across the entire playthrough. Flipping the script entirely in Act 2, the warm, sunny coastline of Act 1 is swapped for the Shadow Cursed Lands, a land of darkness, broken and warped by shadows that can kill you if you don't have the light to fight them off, it immediately sets the scene for a more perilous adventure. And just when you thought the game couldn't get any bigger than it already was, in Act 3, the training wheels are fully off, and the game pushes you into a massive, sprawling environment of the city of Baldur's Gate, and essentially tells you to find your own way. One particular critique I have seen is that Act 3 is so packed full of content that to many players it becomes overwhelming to a point they never even finish the story. It is true that there is so much to do in Act 3 that it could very well justify being its own full game, separate from Acts 1 and 2. Whilst I can certainly understand this criticism, I believe that when it all is said and done, Baldur's Gate 3 is a game designed for multiple playthroughs, either with a differently aligned character who makes different choices to your previous character, or with friends in a co-op experience. Besides, the game's called Baldur's Gate, and the first two acts are underscored with the intention of your party eventually reaching the city. There's anticipation for the city throughout the game. The payoff for getting there is a vast, interconnected web of quests and interactions. And if you do miss anything on your first playthrough, that is fine. You will most definitely catch it in the second, third, or even the fourth time around. There's this great moment in the epilogue, where the character speaks to Withers and says they feel there were some things they wish they could have done differently, 
that can be almost interpreted as the developers addressing this analysis paralysis that some players experienced. If thou could only see the paths of fate untaken, thy mind would surely break, be glad of thy chosen path. It is, after all, thine. Personally, an approach that worked for me was treating every big quest like an actual D&D session, dedicating one or two evenings to just getting one objective knocked off the board. And by controlling it like that, I found Act 3 became much more manageable. As well as the expansive main story, we have side quests that are just as good, if not better, than the original title holders for best side quests in an RPG, which, for me, was The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077. These side quests can be their own condensed stories, but are so vast and feel so important that you realise that you've spent numerous hours on something other than the main plot. But most of them have a certain way of circling you back round to the main objective, as most of the side objectives revolve around members of your camp or tie into the main story progression, such as when the party travels to hell to retrieve the Orphic Hammer from the House of Hope. If done, it unlocks an entirely new ending path for the player to take. Speaking of camp members, I've already said in prior videos, but I will say it again. It cannot be overstated that the characters of Baldur's Gate 3 are some of the most well-written, best-performed, and in-depth I've ever seen from an RPG ever with some absolute standout performances that will stay with me for a very, very long time. With these characters, we see a group of people who couldn't be any more different, brought together by extraordinary circumstances to fight a common enemy that threatens them all. As we begin to meet these characters, we soon realise that they are, in their own ways, broken. For example, you have Karlak, a tiefling barbarian, sold to a demon by Enver Gortash, someone she once called a friend. Her heart is then ripped out and replaced with an infernal engine, and she is forced to become an unwilling champion in hell. And yet, when you meet her, she still approaches life with wit and a smile on her face, all the while the burning hot infernal engine that is keeping her alive in one realm is actively killing her in hours. A side quest can be particularly heartbreaking. In a moment in which Gortash is finally defeated, Karlak fully unravels as she realises vengeance fixed nothing. In the end, she's still either forced back into hell to face its hordes, or the engine will explode, and she will die. In direct contrast, we have Astarian, a vampire spawn who operates under a guise of cockiness and a huge ego. All as a defense mechanism to deal with the trauma of hundreds of years of torment and abuse by his vampire lord Cazador. Like Karlak, Astarian wants revenge, and as the story progresses and he learns more about his master's true plans, he doesn't just want to kill him, he wants to replace him as an ascended vampire lord. Astarian's story is probably the single most compelling companion quest out of them all with genuine questions of morality that will leave you wondering whether what you did was right or if it was your decision to make at all. Not to mention, a standout performance by Neil Newbern that cemented him taking home the best performance at the 2023 Game Awards. When my paladin Bringyar first met Astarian, he did not like him very much. But as time progressed, Astarian became a mainstay on my team. Whilst I'd be swapping out the other two spots occasionally, Astarian would always remain. Initially, due to his incredible rogue stats that carried me through the first half of the game, but eventually he became almost like a brother in arms, and I went into the Cazador fight with the express intent of saving Astarian and keeping him not just as a team member, but as a friend by any means necessary. With their specific side quests, almost every companion gets their moment to shine, and I don't think there was a single one that failed to elicit some form of emotion out of me. The story of Baldur's Gate 3 isn't just brilliant storytelling, but at its core, it is also a technical achievement. 
The way that almost every single plot thread ties itself together in the end for a fully complete experience, with a beginning, middle, and end, is remarkable. With an epilogue that shuts the book on the story in a satisfying way, but still leaves a bit more room for potential adventures to come. Although, I think it may be a long, long time before we see another game on the scale of Baldur's Gate 3 that is as well made. Now let's move on to the uh, mechanic side of things. Much like the property it's based on, in Baldur's Gate 3, the central focus of gameplay in and out of combat is on dice rolls and probability checks. Many are passive and take place automatically, such as in combat, or when a player is close to a point of interest, like a buried chest or a hidden wall. Others are manual, allowing the player to roll virtual dice to complete tasks such as disarming traps, lock picking, and speech skill checks to succeed in certain lines of dialogue. I cannot overstate how many times I rolled a check in this game and either yelled, YES! or OH GOD NO! It is implemented perfectly and it ties into what I previously said about the game, making sure all your choices matter. For an RPG, it would be relatively easy for a speech check to essentially get the player a little extra dialogue or maybe an in-game item, and then put them back on a narrow narrative path. Think like Fallout 4. But in the vast and almost ever-expanding story of Baldur's Gate 3, you try and make a check and it goes wrong, there's usually genuine consequences for this. Consequences that could have the potential to spin so far out of control to a point you are now on an entirely new narrative trajectory. The player will come to rely not just on their character's abilities, but also their party's various skill sets to succeed and shape the story of their playthrough to how they want it to be. As well as this, Baldur's Gate 3 also has a very interesting mechanic inherited from earlier titles, Karmic Rolling, a method described to balance out good and bad rolling, effectively avoiding streaks of good rolls and bad rolls. As I learnt whilst I was researching this uh, mechanic, it's actually fairly divisive amongst the community, as some feel that it takes away that element of true randomness and a need to adapt to it that comes with Dungeons & Dragons. It also tends to make rolling way more predictable. The player knows they're on a heart streak, so the game will come in to break it just when they don't want it to. This was my overall experience of Karmic Rolling, so I kept it off for the most part, as I did not necessarily feel a need for it, mostly due to the fact I'd rely on my character and my party's proficiencies to succeed. When it comes to combat, to put it simply, it's fantastic. It is challenging, but fair, and requires a level of strategic thinking and engagement that, I will not lie, I was initially very much not used to at all, mostly due to a lack of overall experience with turn-based combat in games of this scale. Especially in the bigger fights, a good strategy and a well-balanced party are the keys to success. If you go in with too much of one thing over another, you're going to have a bad time. This is a lesson I learned the hard way, as my usual party composition for much of the game was a paladin, a rogue, a barbarian, and a cleric, with the express goal of dealing high damage and finishing fights as soon as possible. I eventually realised later than I should have, this approach is not a universal recipe for success, and I had to let go of my own stubbornness and affinity for my current party and to start experimenting with my team composition in order to win these fights I was struggling with. With both combat and exploration, Baldur's Gate 3 pushes you as the player to get creative and experiment. Whether that be using the environment to your advantage, or changing the party that you go into a fight with. As we've already mentioned, some party compositions work far better for certain fights than the one you may have already been using. It pushes this creativity well, and successfully manages to avoid combat ever becoming stale, repetitive, or boring for the player. And over an entire 146 hour playthrough, not having your combat become stale even once is a... Tremendous achievement. At points, Baldur's Gate 3 can be difficult, especially in the later game where threats that have been built up over the course of the game finally come into being. However, by this point, 
The game is trusting the player to know how to best approach a fight and who may be the best people to bring to get the job done. Something that I naturally didn't do. The way Baldur's Gate 3 leverages all of its mechanics allows for numerous instances of true creative freedom. I remember seeing an article about how Sven Vink, the CEO of Larian Studios, watched Matt Mercer stack over 40 crates on top of each other to access a section of the city early. Rather than punishing this and patching out such methods, this way of thinking was actually applauded because this single 45 second clip perfectly encapsulates the kind of game Baldur's Gate 3 is. And it's all thanks to an incredible amount of attention to detail, Larian Studios have managed, somewhat remarkably, to emulate those moments of madness, brilliance, feelings of pure joy, anguish, horror, and comedy that can only take place around a D&D table. If, like me, you are entirely unfamiliar with the wider world of Baldur's Gate and its decades worth of lore, this game can be incredibly daunting to start. However, if you persist, in a surprisingly small amount of time, you'll come to realize that this game is not just another run-of-the-mill RPG, but rather it is something that comes around maybe once or twice in a generation. I was so happy when I saw the overwhelmingly positive recognition Baldur's Gate 3 received from both the community and the industry in 2023. Managing to run away with almost every major game award handed out that year, it is clear to see that behind Baldur's Gate 3 is a studio and employees that are passionate about what they do. Recently, Larian Studios announced their decision to move away from this IP and its owner, Wizards of the Coast, which I was initially saddened by, as I would have loved more content from Larian in this world. I also fully understood that Larian wishes to pursue their own projects instead. And given that Wizards of the Coast and their parent company Hasbro over the last few years have had a pretty awful track record when it comes to moral business practices, I can understand Larian not wishing to commit to a long-standing arrangement between them. Baldur's Gate 3 missed out on being my 2023 game of the year losing out to Elm Wake 2. And believe me when I say, the margins between these two were incredibly tight for me. However, I can say with confidence that Baldur's Gate 3 is one of the best games I have played in the last five years. Do you want to screw it? Last 10 years. And one of, if not the best RPG I have ever played. And I am thankful that I decided to give it a chance as it's now opened up the door to various other games of its kind. And as I write this review, I am currently starting a playthrough of Divinity Original Sin 2. And so far, it's absolutely what I was expecting, and I'm very excited to see where this new adventure takes me. And that is the review of Baldur's Gate 3. Sorry this one took so long. This is actually one of the first reviews I started to write, when I, well, when I started writing game reviews uh, at the beginning of this year. But I, I delayed it and delayed it and delayed it because it's the one I truly wanted to do justice because it's huge, sprawling, and I wanted to make sure that I covered everything and also consulted some experts, the experts being my partner. Thank you very much for helping me edit this script. You are amazing, and I love you very much. Thank you all very much for watching, and I shall see you in the next review. I have no idea what that will be. Uh, it might be Elden Ring, because I'm done with that now. So, um, we'll see. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye now.